Okay. Yes, I think we have two weeks left, right? Um, we have this week is the last online lecture, and I come to this in a second uh, when I make some announcement. And then next week, oh yeah, sorry for that, I forgot to thank you um, to have the live transcript. Um, yes, okay. So where did I stop? This week is the last online lecture. This is the last time you can see me standing in my bedroom. You can see, I think, if you want to, there's my my dog is this time with us. He, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, my wife has to be uh, at the university, so I have the honor to teach alongside my dog. And thanks. Uh, I agree, he's very cute. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, that is uh, noted. Um, that's why we got him. He's also not very well behaved, so we'll see. Um, maybe he falls asleep or maybe he whines through the whole thing. Well, one way or the other. Um, but that is less important. I think we have two weeks left. We have this is uh, the last online lecture here. I will start with uh, some announcement next week. This is also the week, oh, I think I said it in the email, this is also the week where we have the last time our Friday seminars. We will focus uh, uh, not exclusively, but mostly, most of the sessions will be about coursework, okay? We're trying to kind of make sure that everyone is on the same page when it comes to coursework. We started a little bit last week by looking at the scenarios and which content might be the most relevant to these scenarios and will we continue that. Some of the questions <clears throat> I got via emails kind of was like, oh, this seems to be something that you guys are wondering so i want to we want to uh connie Yasmin and i want to kind of use the chance and talk about this in the uh, seminars this will be on friday this week we have a really exciting topic uh social influence <clears throat> i think way too much content as usual i think but uh we will take it slow and make sure that we cover it we will uh, have some of the really like the most influential and best in a good sense, not in a uh, notorious sense of experiments in social psychology this week. So I'm really excited about that. Let me start with um, doing, okay, sharing some of the announcements for this week's. Um, next week, I just want to say that I think we have like a, so next Thursday, the main session will be, and this is the picture of the uh, uh, monkeys there. That's why the monkeys are there. We will talk about altruistic behavior. We will talk about pro-social behavior. This is one of my research interests, something I study, and we will focus on why people help other, help other people and why they don't help uh, other people, which are con the conditions that we're more likely to do that and which other conditions we're less likely to do that. I don't know. I hope you can't hear too much of my dog whining in the background. I'm not sure why he's doing it. Maybe the monkeys get him excited. Um, <clears throat> or it might be that he's excited to see James and Lauren, um, who will be there next week too, who will be kind of in the beginning, we will have our short, but uh, hopefully exciting award ceremony. And those of you who are in the group that will win and the runners up, they will get some prizes and um, Okay, now he's ripping up a book that's not good. Give me one sec. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> Sorry for that. Um, um, okay, you, oh God. All right, this is worse than I expected. Um, what did I say? Oh, maybe my dog is excited. That's what's the joke I wanted to connect it. Maybe he's excited to see Lauren and James. We will have our short uh, award ceremony. Um, the winners will get their medals um, from the group. So that's very exciting. I hope the runners up will get something too. And Lauren, our program director, James, our deputy will come along and maybe we can get a little uh, like a, a person from the press to take a picture and we can tweet it out uh, so that the winners get their due rewards. But the most part of it will be on um, uh, uh, altruistic and pro-social behavior. The session will be recorded. I think that's a question I got uh, quite a bit. Um, it will be recorded via lec le uh, lecture capture. I think you're a generation of students who never experienced lecture capture. It's a little bit different. It's not as good, the recording, I think. I think Yasmin knows it from her days. Um, as a student, this was <laughs> before the pandemic. This is how we recorded lectures. So you will see the slides. You will see me. Um, my microphone will be recorded. I think, I don't know, Yasmin can put her comment in, in the chat how she remembers it. Does it work? Does it not work? But it's kind of like it 
will be available. So if you had already kind of, I think one international student wrote me, she already had plans to leave and then she can't come, then uh, I think that's an alternative, but it's definitely much worse than uh, 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 coming along. I know 9 a.m., I think neither Connie nor Yasmin nor I are really, nor James, who's extreme uh, evening person, are very excited about this early start, but this is what we got from the university. And let's just make the most out of it. Um, <clears throat> Then, okay, one thing slightly unrelated that I just wanted to announce tomorrow, uh, the application for prep, which a lot of you guys uh, uh, ask me about will start prep is a, is a psychology research excellent program that I started at the at City University here you see the first cohort a picture of the first cohort when we uh, did it the first time. Um, this is a chance for you guys uh, during the summer uh, during the upcoming summer and the third year to collect research experience, one thing that is really dear and near and dear to my heart, not only because i'm a researcher, but also because research experience is next to academic success and work experience, one of the pillars that really sets you apart if you're interested interested in uh, uh, having a wonderful career with your psychology degree. If you're interested in becoming a researcher, it's obvious that you should be interested in that. Um, but if you uh, want to become a clinical uh, psychologist, education, etc., then uh, research experience, ex additional research experience is a real game changer. This is the idea. I don't want to talk too much about this. I will send around the announcement tomorrow. The applications will uh, start tomorrow. So those of you who are here, they're more likely to be uh, uh, you're, uh, uh, very likely to be really good students um, that should think about applying for this program. And I think um, the kind of reputation of the program um, uh, speaks for itself. And I think it's a really good uh, chance for you guys to get research experience. So keep your eyes open. There will be an email tomorrow announcing that. But let's come to today's um, uh, um, Uppsala. Today's uh, lecture, which is on social psychology, social influence, and we will talk about social psychology. Obviously, we will talk about social influence. And let me kind of start by giving you a little bit of an overview of the topics we want to touch on today in this lecture, but also in the additional videos. And let me just close my door. Okay, I hope that's it for the dark. We'll see. Um, okay, so we want to talk about some of the topics, or I want to kind of tease a little bit the topics that we talked today about, but also give you an intuition about what we were talking in the additional videos who are already on uh, uh, Moodle and which I urge you to watch uh, during this week. One of the most, I think, interesting and most widely applied uh, topics, social influence, especially if you're interested in anything that's related to marketing, that is related to advertisement, um, that is related to organizational psychology. One of the kind of key ideas here that we in the beginning will look at is that basically social norms. Social norms are a little bit like um, uh, water to fish. Um, for us, social norms is we're uh, constantly surrounded by them and and we shape our behavior in accordance to that. There's a really interesting uh, set of experiments that Garfinkel did in the 1960s of the last century when he asked his students, so I would ask you, why don't you go home tonight and if you go to your parents or the next time you go to your parents and behave as if you're a hotel guest, not behave as if you're a daughter or a, uh, a son, but simply go home and behave as if you were a guest at your home. So what happened is that the students went home and acted much more politely as they normally, normally would. So what do you think the parents will, uh, how will they respond to and why? And this will be the beginning of our first part of our lecture today. And then we will kind of look a little bit at <laughs> um, a famous experiment by Solomon Ash, which you probably already know, where we look at, okay, what if the majority around you suggests something really crazy? So, for instance, if the majority around you thinks that the C line, the line above the C, is uh, most equal to the X line, 
right? And now you look at that and now you're asked to indicate your own answer. You ask, what do you think is the line that resembles most the line that's on top of the X? And you might look like that person in that picture from the experiment and think like, oh my God, what is going on? Why is everyone C? So we want to look at the situation when the majority goes against the minority, how the minority helps, even if it's obviously wrong. We want to also talk a little bit about something that um, I think is really interesting, not so much about just the factors that enable the majority to dominate the minority, but I also want to talk a little bit about minority influence. When is it and how can minorities uh, change the perception of the majority? So, for instance, you might think, OK, I want to change people's in Britain, people's uh, preferences. They think that, according to uh, a recent uh, uh, um, a survey, that cheese and onion is the best crisps. But do you think it crisps uh, uh, um, flavor? But maybe you are a hula hoop, salt and vinegar person. Only 8% think that hula hoop, salt and vinegar are the best crisps, uh, crisps, crisps out there, uh, uh, not crisps. And so how, what do you have to do to now influence the majority that you are right and they are wrong? And there are instances, right, in our societies when the minority dominates the majority or not dominates, it changes the mind of the majority. What are the situations where suddenly the uh, proverbial hula hoop, salt and vinegar become the new uh, cheese and onion? How is that possible? What do you have to do? Um, and then we want to talk uh, in the second part. So these are in the first part, and this is basically what our lecture is about today, is all about situations where social influence comes from indirect sources. So in all of the instances that we look at in the first part, the social influence is exerted passively. Nobody is directly asking you to change your behavior. In the second part, we want to look at two types when, uh, of social influence when another person asks you directly. So the first one is compliance, okay? So if I ask you something crazy, uh, would you do it, right? So in this experiment that we will start um, with uh, the, the compliance section, it's a university, uh, a, a, a Yale University experiment where the experimenter asks the students at the beginning, please give me your cell phone and let me look through your apps for five minutes. Okay, so there's a stranger that asks you to give um, their, uh, your cell phone to them so that they can look through it. So unlock it and let me look through it. How many of the students do you think will uh, comply to that? And that will be the start of the second section where we look at kind of direct social influence and we look at the power of asking compliance, but we will also look at the power of ordering, right? And we will end with um, Milgram's really fantastic uh, a series of experiments. I think it's like 10, 12 different variations of the Milgram uh, uh, kind of obedience experiments, which um, had a really long lasting impact on the way we think about people. What are the factors that people obey orders? Why do they follow one person, not the other? Who are the people that they follow? And what are the conditions under which we disobey? So this will be also part of the recorded videos that are on Moodle now. But these are the letter to uh, two forms of direct social influence. But now we want to talk about indirect social influence, which is all about. Conf oh, OK. So sorry, I was uh, one too fast. Um, so we would talk about conformity, types of conformity, majority and minority influence. I think this will be it for the lecture. And then the rest will be on a video. I was initially planned to have compliance there too, but it might not be too, that might be too ambitious. And I will upload the video after the lecture for that as well. And then, so compliance, compliance strategic request. Um, this is kind of like, how can you set up? How can you ask specifically another person that they are more likely to comply to your requests? Right. Um, how do you have to structure that? And then we will talk about obedience and the causes of obedience. Why are we so eager, as you will see, to follow a scientist who tells us that in the name of science, we should endanger the life of another person? Why are so many of us, most of us, about 70 to 80 percent willing to do so? And we will look at that in the um, last two chapters of this um, week. 
One thing that's kind of like interesting to think about and connected a little bit to the previous um, uh, uh, content is to think about, okay, if you look at the theory of plant behavior, if you think a little bit about why people behave in a certain way, right, then we paid a lot of attention to attitudes, which is like, oh, um, yes, okay, I'm recording, right, oh God, for a moment I was like, am I actually recording, but I think I'm recording, let's hope I'm recording, uh, Yasmin is nothing, that's good, okay, so, right, why are be people behaving the way they do, one of the key factors we talked about, right, Gordon Alport stressed them again and again, is the uh, power of attitudes, we talked about explicit attitudes, we talked about implicit attitudes, and we talked about the factors that kind of create these attitudes about other people, then we talked a little bit about kind Kind of like the beliefs we have about behavior this was when we talked about social explanation but now we want to talk about the power of norms right we want to say like okay if i am it's like why are people behaving the way they do one of the key sources of influence are the norms that they perceive are around them right we want to look at different aspects of norms and we also want to know now in the first three sections um when norms are really powerful to influence our behavior and what are the common causes of these norms. So that helps you to kind of put a little bit the whole session today in the context of our social psychology program. One thing we will not talk about, and not because it's not interesting, but because we just don't really have the time to do so, is automatic mimicry. If you're interested in that, um, uh, Tanya Shatrans, he, who is here in this uh, uh, paper, the first author, she has a really wonderful um, line of research on um, uh, uh, automatic mimicry. And so what do we mean by that is basically that the presence of another person influences my nonverbal behavior, but also my emotions. So if you're in her experiment, you see a picture of her experiment in, uh, on the right, right, where uh, you would be um, a student or a participant in one of her studies and uh, in the corner somebody would either cross their arms or cross their legs and then they would look how likely is it that you now cross your arms or cross your legs too um, so this is a really subtle form of social influence where you change the way you stand or sit or behave or smile and this also works for emotions just because of the mere presence of somebody else um, I think it's the most gentlest and um, uh, and maybe has the least uh, practical into, uh, implications uh, of all the social influence factors, but nevertheless a really interesting one. So if you're interested in nonverbal behavior and how it's kind of contagious in social situation, then you should I uh, 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 direct you to Tanya Chatran's um, research. Um, okay, let's talk about conformity. And what we social psychologists think about conformity. So conformity is for us when we follow, um, or like uh, conformity as a social psychology uh, psychologist means that another person changes their attitudes, their beliefs, or their behaviors to match those of the group. Okay. We often think that um, uh, some people are really conformists, right? You think like, oh, who's a conformist? Oh, somebody who wears a suit, and there are other people who are really individual and they're completely non-conformist, right? But I think as the picture kind of highlights here, um, we are all, whether we want it or not, you cannot escape social norms. You cannot escape certain um, social rules of how you should dress, how you should talk, how you should stand, how you should behave, right? You can see it on the right even if you're a punk, right? It's like a movement that is basically a non-conformist. We want to break out of society. We want to dress differently. You cannot dress as a punk in a completely individualistic way. No, as you can see, they all have an overlapping set of, of shoes, of trousers that are accepted, of jackets, of haircuts, and so forth, right? And this is like, there's basically wherever you go, wherever you, um, uh, uh, whether you're uh, kind of like uh, joining a bank, or joining a punk group, uh, you will be surrounded by social norms, by certain rules that tell you what to think, what to like, what not to like, and so forth, right? Um, so it's a very pervasive impact uh, the norms have. And we wanna better understand why and how. 
Um, this is the uh, kind of like the social breaching experiments that I mentioned before by the sociologist uh, Garfinkel. He became uh, famous for these because he wrote a book and he asked his students to kind of experience it, right? It's a very different approach, it's also a sociological approach. But here I would you ask you as a lecturer to go home and kind of try to experience what it means to gently um, break those social norms that are around us, right? Um, so these social norms, I said it previously, they are kind of like the waters to fish we're constantly surrounded by it and sometimes we forget that they exist but if we gently breach them as he asked Garfinka as his, his students to do then you can see them really at work so for instance in the example that I said in the beginning where the students go home and they act as if they were hotel guests with their own parents the parents first become really concerned that something is wrong if I would go home and uh, act towards my mother as if I um uh, 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 kind of like a hotel guest, she would think like maybe there's something wrong with Andreas. What's going on? Is there something wrong with our relationship? And then she would probably get angry. My mother always, <laughs> not always, that's wrong, but often uh, complains that I am too polite to her, which sounds maybe a little weird if you say it like that, but she feels like <laughs> impoliteness is a sign of uh, uh, closeness. So she doesn't want it. She feels like a mother and a son. They're different norms than, um, uh, for instance, if I talk to you guys. Um, so here, the kind of the the moment you breach these social norms, you can really feel them, how the other, like the environment around you uh, reacts, concerned, irritated, aggressive to get you back to behave in a certain way. Obviously, this is not a real experiment, but it kind of highlights nicely um, what happens and might be something you can try if you're uh, bored at home and see how your parents react. Um, Sharif, the same Mustafa Sharif, who did the, um, uh, I was like, what is it called? Robber's Cave Studies. I was like, ah, oh, what you, Robber's Cave Studies at the Robber's Cave Park in Oregon. Um, he did also uh, uh, studies on social um on social norms and how they work okay and one of his most famous what he did is like he would put um uh, participants in a dark room and all they could see was a white dot okay and so there this is kind of like he wanted to take advantage of an optical illusion if you sit in a um uh, a dark room with a uh, white dot at some points this will feel like the dot is moving okay this is an optical illusion. The dot is not moving. It's because some involuntary uh, head movements and some uh, involuntary eye movements and other factors play into that. But it will be that uh, some inches, some centimeters, whatever a unit of measurement you use, you will feel like, oh, it's moving. OK, um, this is individual for everyone. So there's not like if Yasmin sees like it moves, uh, I don't know, six centimeters. I measure in centimeters. Sorry, I think the study was in inches. Let's say in three inches to the right. I might feel like it's one. It's more like one inch to the right. OK, so everyone has a different perception of that. Um, so what Sharif did is he kind of wanted to see how if I would people in such an ambiguous perceptively ambiguous situation, how would they kind of coordinate as a group? So what he did is, uh, let me just kind of quickly activate a pen here. So this is in a first session, right? Let's say all of us would be in a room and we would kind of see this. We didn't, we wouldn't really know what other people would say. So I uh, would say like, oh, I think it went like eight inches to the, uh, uh, moved eight inches, right? This is like the, the movement, the estimated amount of movement here in inches. And then Yasmin would maybe say one and Connie would say, okay, I think it moved two inches, right? So now I would know what Yasmin and Connie would think okay and now you can see the second time we are alone in this and it's like oh, okay it seems like my aid was a little there was a little much right and at the end of these group sessions connie yasmin and i at least on this measure see this ambiguous weird situation in one way we perceive now the reality of that situation as one okay so um sharif was really interested in that kind of like how we coordinate our perception of the world in, under these uh, situations of ambiguity or uncertainty. And in this conceptualization, one of the key aspects was that basically what we do is we look for others in order to reduce uncertainty. So here it would be in a situation where I'm not quite sure what I should see, right? 
and so I look to others, I look to if I would be in one per, um, experiment with Connie and Yasmin and maybe some uh, of you, then I would kind of look at you and just like, oh, what are they doing? What are they thinking? Oh, okay, eight seems too much off. And so we would start coordinating. This is also an experiment very much about the emergence of these social norms. At the end, we know it is kind of the norm to say something around 2.8 inches is the movement of this um, um, of this dot, right? So we have established a kind of reality now, and maybe, and we come back to that, maybe that is actually how we now perceive the world, okay? Maybe it is the perception now, maybe our brain now has changed the input so that we all kind of reliably say the same thing. Um, one very interesting line was like, uh, or like probably one that you're already familiar with, but I just want to kind of highlight it again and explain it a little bit. Maybe there are some of you who have not heard of it, is the research by Solomon Ash, right? But here is something he was interested in saying like, okay, in the Sharif studies, what we know is that groups can change the perception of ambiguous situations, of um, uncertain situations where I'm not quite sure what I should think of. But what happens if there's out there's like a clear true uh, truth okay and do the social uh, influence can we still see social influence if i know one thing is right uh, but then the group says another thing what um uh, will happen right so first what ash did is like he this the task is always the same there's an x line or a line on top of the x i will just call it x line i think i hope that makes sense and then on the right there are three other lines a b c and so if you would be a participant you would be asked to judge which of these ABC lines do you think matches the X line the best, right? And obviously all of us, I hope, um, would um, uh, <laughs> see that B is the closest or looks almost similar to X, right? So Ash did this, and I think more than 95% of this, his participants got the right line on all these trials. So um, there's always like, there's actually research articles about the, uh, what is up with the five, not in this particular, but there are always 5% in service and experiments who kind of behave slightly weird. Um, so you even Ash already in the 50s found that. But basically all participants can see what is the right answer, the true answer answer right there's no ambiguity here okay so obviously if this would be all of his experiments we wouldn't experiment we wouldn't still talk about it what he did is then he invited students um and this is sorry slightly blurry but this is like an original photo this is how it looked right i think there are some uh, as you like an introduction you saw some slightly better pictures but he would basically now say okay let's say you're this person here okay and you're trying to uh, see <laughs> a not extremely diverse set of students here at that time i don't know where solomon ash was i think he was somewhere on the west coast stanford or so um and so this student would be our participant and all the others are confederates Okay, so Confederates means they are basically uh, on the team of the experimenter. So now we would see the task on the uh, left here that would be displayed on this kind of, I don't know, um, uh, uh, old fashioned projector. <laughs> and, and so now um, uh, Ash or the experimenter would say like, okay, which line do you think matches the X line the most? And then this person would say C, and this person would say C, and this person would say C, and this person would say C, this person would say C, and this person would say C. And then they ask you, and what do you think? Right? And so now everyone looks at you and says, okay, what do you think is the right answer? Um, and what you can see that in 37%, the person would say, oh, I think C2. I think it's just like, there are two things. Um, yes, there's like, I think there was one question. These are like the others. Oh, I'm not sure what the question was about the Confederates. Mim, was that, if you can repeat that, oh, sorry. Uh, if you can repeat the question, if that's about the Ash experiment or the Sharif experiment. In the Sharif, there were no Confederates. These were kind of uh, naturally emerging groups. Here, every everyone but one, the participant, is a confederate, okay? So only this one person here, this guy would be a participant and all the others would be confederates, okay? Okay, great. Um, uh, so 
everyone else would be a confederate right there's yeah this is not that all the other students are crazy it's just they're basically paid to be crazy um i think this is just one like there are two things to highlight here a sometimes this is kind of described as oh social norms they change everything right it's like um Everyone says C, and now suddenly all the people say C2, right? In 63% of the cases, right, in, in most cases, they went with the right answer, okay? I think, so you can say, look, oh, okay, social norms don't matter. But I mean, the craziness of saying C in this situation, right, that you would change your mind and say, it's not B, it is C, uh, makes it so striking. And this is why we are still talking about it. Right, we come back a little bit under the conditions when you massive you can massively increase that right if the situation is at least a little bit more uh, uh, ambiguous right. But here there's no ambiguity, and still we find this kind of social influence at least in 37 percent of the cases. Um, so I think what I will so now we are kind of like want to answer two questions. Okay, one of the questions is kind of like why. Do people change? And the other question is um, that we want to look a little, or why, not why, why, like, why do we change our behavior? Yeah, like, I think in some ways you can say, like, oh, being a conformist is not really cool, right? We want to be individuals, at least in the UK. This is a, there's a, uh, in the US and other countries, Western culture is very much dominated by the idea we should be strong individualistic. We should follow our own norms and own ideas, and we shouldn't so much just run after the herd. So why do we change so much? And the other one is like, are there different types of uh, conformity? And at the heart of this is the question, uh, for instance, in the ASH experiment, do they actually, when they change their mind, when they say, instead of the right answer B, they say C, do they actually believe it C or do they just say it C, right? And here you can see basically as an intuition, these are the kind of like two types of conformity, right? Uh, where you actually believe or you just behave in a way. Okay. So one, I think in the beginning, we talked a little bit about this. And I don't want to kind of uh, talk too much about this, but the key reason we think we're so susceptible to norms is that this is basically part of our kind of um, evolutionary heritage, right? If you remember, there was kind of this idea of why do we kind of outlast it every other uh, 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 humans, other, other species of humans, why did we survive so long and others did not? It's like the idea that we are so social, right? That we can interact in these large groups. And one key determinant of this interactions. Um, yes, okay, I think this is like Jasmine uh, posted this in. Um, so, um, yes, so one key like, question here is like, okay, how did we do it? And social norms are part of the answer. There are two kind of really key components to that. One is information and one is quick change of behavior. So imagine that we would be like, uh, we are a group of uh, 150 homo sapiens. We are traveling through the Serengeti about um, uh, 70,000 years ago. And there's a cave. I don't know if there are caves in the Serengeti, maybe not, but let's say it's a cave. And suddenly the people who go into the cave, they all come running out, okay? Uh, I want to say a bear, but there are probably no bears in the Serengeti. What no, who knows what 70,000 years ago, what crazy animals were running around on planet Earth, right? And so um, here there's the idea, it's like, okay, I could be a real individualist and kind of say like, oh, I'm not going, because, just because everyone is running, I will not. I want to know for myself what's in that cave, what makes it so dangerous, right? Giant sloths, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, Yasmin says, yeah, there's some really terrifying animals at that time, which were all killed off by humans or by homo sapiens, to be more precise, uh, around, I think the, the last giant sloth died around 10,000 years ago. But one key aspect is like, there's uh, social norms, everyone is running, I look, there's like ambiguous situation, I get information. And the other one is, I just kind of behave as everyone else, because more often than not, this will ensure our um, uh, survival and helps us to coordinate. So there's real uh, great value of following social norms, right? There's a real great positive side to social norms that we often forget. But rightfully so, I think there's also a negative one. And we think of this often here. This is really nicely captured by Martin Luther King Jr.'s quote. Um, uh, Many people fear nothing 
more terribly than to take a position which stands out sharply and clearly from the prevailing opinion. Okay, not a few men who cherish lofty, lofty and noble ideas hide them under a bushel for fear of being called different. Right. I don't want to like kind of like stretch this metaphor too far. Right. I think Martin Luther King was fighting for racial equality. And in the Ash experiment, um, this is about uh, uh, like lines in an experiment um, uh, and whether you actually uh, uh, say the right thing. You say it's B, it's not C. Um, but there are some parallels. Right. This is kind of like the what Martin Luther King Jr. talks about. This is exactly what you can see in the Ash experiment. They know the right answer. They know it's B, not C, but on 37% of the cases, they hide um, uh, they, they write the truth on a bushel for fear of being called different, right? Um, and so there's a negative side to it. And now we want to kind of look at it. Okay, like, is it behavior? Or is it truly that people change um, their, or this was kind of like the analogy, I think here, uh, uh, to, that I want to make to the Martin Luther uh, King Jr. quote, but is this like the person here, is he actually thinking if he changes that it's C and not B, right? What type of conformity can we see in the Ash experiments and maybe what type of conformity are we more likely to see in the Sharif ones? Um, one of kind of like, I think, uh, uh, modern day uh, strong influence of social norms is reviews, Amazon, any types of reviews, right? And this highlights these kind of other aspects that I was talking about earlier, the informational value of social norms, right? Here's this example. Last year, I was, um, I mean, my garden still looks pretty bad, um, but I was thinking about, okay, I want to get some um, grass going in my backyard. Um, which seed should I buy, right? I didn't want to learn anything about grassland seed, couldn't care less, but I just needed them. So I just went to Amazon, look what has the highest ratings, okay. And I thought like if 5,000 people give it a 4.5 rating, this is good enough for me, right? So here is basically, I'm tapping into the informational power or kind of like the wisdom of the crowd to um, change my behavior. So there's also a real kind of interesting and important piece of social norms that they transmit information. Um, so you can think a little bit about this as similar to the Sharif situation, right? So the Martin Luther King one fits better to the Ash one, the Sharif situation fits better to the Amazon one. Well, I'm not sure there's an ambiguous situation. There are tons of different seats out there. I don't know which one is the best. Uh, there's this kind of erratic movement of this dot. I don't really know what I'm seeing. What should I think? And here the norm is more about information. So if you kind of summarize this, you can think about on top, we have the Sharif experiments, which kind of um, uh, stand in for experiments where it's all about information. And then we have the ash ones, which are stand in as experiments where it's about kind of like uh, changing your behavior to fit in with the behavior of the group, right? So we call one like this group effect. How does the group affect our uh, thinking and behavior? One is kind of like the informational influence, right? Here I get the uh, information from the group. And the other one is a normative influence. So it's like, this is how we behave, okay? Um, so the former is more about kind of changing your actual beliefs, which social psychologists often like to call private conformity. So you actually now believe, oh, I think on average, the dot moves two and a half inches, right? Or I now think that speedy seat, I think that's what where it was called, is a really good um, seat and I should buy it, right? Um, so this is what we call private conformity because it is really some a change in the person, right? Normative influence is public conformity. Um, this is something where I basically just pretend um, uh, that I uh, kind of, oh yes, I believe that too, I think it is C. We think now for many lines of research, but I will blur the line in the next slide a little bit, but we think often that in the ASH experiment, what really happens is public conformity. They don't think that C is actually longer than B, but they say it. And what we think in, in more, um, 
uh, ambiguous situation, it's more about private conformity. Public conformity, I grew up in East Germany, I think I mentioned it uh, several times now, I'm sorry for that. But I was like, public conformity in East Germany was basically part of the daily bread. We would often have to celebrate new record achievements, a new record harvest. There was every year we had a record harvest. Everyone knew that this is... Um, wrong, that there was no record harvest, that the stores are empty, uh, and yet we would go to school and we would um, praise the socialist farmers who uh, bestowed another record harvest upon us. So public conformity is something I was very familiar with and uh, which is often kind of like a part of more dictatorial uh, systems. Um, Yes. Oh, this is good. Okay. Public conformity, this is like one thing I forgot to mention now, is also means it has a more temporary impact and uh, private conformity has a more long lasting impact. Okay. So if I really change my mind based on because I change my beliefs, then this has a longer impact. Public conformity is often just a temporary display of behaviors. There are two uh, really interesting studies that I want to kind of mention here uh, quickly that kind of use neuroscientific methods to disentangle that. In the study by Burns and colleagues, what they did is they looked at, okay, after conformity, when I see an ash style uh, experiments, the lines again, where do I see after conformity changes in the brain? And the idea here would be for public conformity, for only a change of behavior, we would have more prefrontal controlled areas of the brain. Whereas if the uh, uh, kind of um, social conformity actually changes part of how I perceive the world, then for instance, I should see some changes in early visual areas like the occipital, uh, 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 occipital um, uh, visual cortex V1 or some subcortical regions. And they actually find to a certain degree changes in conformity in um, occipital, visual, and um, subcortical regions, kind of indicating that maybe at least partly sometimes even this kind of in experiments as um, somewhat crazy as ash, we some change uh, the way we perceive, right? You can think about cognitive dissonance here a little bit and how this will enable our, um, um, how this will enable kind of like the changes, right? It's like I kind of said something stupid, so maybe I try to kind of change the filters in my system in order to not to appear too stupid um, in front of myself. The other one, which I really like, which is slightly different, but which I really want to, to mention here, is a study by uh, Chris Frith's group. And what they did is they looked at um, uh, uh, kind of reward um, center uh, neuroactivity when experts told us that uh, they agree that the taste we have in music is really excellent. So let's say, I don't know, uh, you uh, like a certain song and then two experts, you listen to that song and I kind of record um, your uh, rewards um, related areas, uh, the neuroactivity, then two experts tell you, yes, that music is actually excellent. And then you listen to the song again and now I can see you get more pleasure from it. When others agree with our opinion, others agree that we are uh, value, right? Then I get more pleasure from it. So there's also something, there's nothing bad with that, right? It's really good. Now I enjoy my, um, uh, my own uh, kind of like the music even more, right? Uh, which is wonderful. But this also tells you a little bit about how we are wired, right? How our reward system is kind of wired to lead us into kind of um, uh, uh, going along with these social norms. Let me just kind of look at a chat. Um, if maybe I'm seeing it wrong from the group. I'm not quite sure if like the like uh, the person who sent me a, a, a message. I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Uh, uh, happy to try again, um, but I am afraid I don't quite understand it. Um, okay, so. In the last 15 minutes, what we want to talk a little bit is about the conditions under which um, we basically, the majority exerts, or let me see, there's an, uh, uh, 
Um, I'm not, I'm, okay, let's maybe you could ask. I'm not quite sure I understand the questions. This is about like um, seeing and misperceiving it. So the idea in this kind of like looking at V1 areas, right, and activations in these early um, uh, sensory areas is to see if the activity changes there, then you actually change the way you perceive the world, right? It's almost impossible for you to, it is impossible, I think, it is impossible to change consciously activity in the v1 it's such an early area i think this is like basically you have input there after 100 milliseconds or so so this would suggest that conforming actually changes the way you perceive okay i hope this makes sense happy to talk more about this at the end in the office hour um now we want to talk a little bit about the conditions under which the majority is really strong when do we have real majority influence and when sometimes the minority can flip the board okay sometimes as you know we think like certain outside opinions suddenly become the majority opinion right how is that possible under which condition does that happen there's some in a session right if you kind of think about the the key idea we think often of social norm and conformity is like there's some one person that kind of sticks out right one person that have in their heart uh, a different idea than everyone else there's a person that looks different and likes to wear something different and now basically the majority says like oh you shouldn't and it should go away okay so this is kind of like when does the majority basically dominate the minority and the minority kind of disappears okay um don't think of this as kind of like ethnical or religious minorities right um think about this like more about kind of like uh, certain opinions certain attitudes but it definitely has a touch of that too right you can uh, think about how it is when do religious minorities or sects actually prevail and when get they kind of incorporated into um, um, uh, the larger majority, okay? Some of these things are quite obvious, okay? So one of them is group size. Uh, I have like in my notes, group size da, right? The larger the group, the harder for the minority it is to prevail. Think about the ash experiment, think about sitting there and it's not just three more students, it's not 30 students, it's 300. And you are, the, it's like 299 say C, and then you have to say, oh, I think it's um, B. So that makes it less likely. So the bigger the majority, the uh, less chance the minority has to prevail. And so uh, group size is really important. The other one we talked a little bit about, oh, this is like, okay, is um, in the kind of the situation. If we have, and this is, I don't know if this is the greatest visualization of this effect, but if we have an ambiguous situation, then the majority has a stronger impact on the major minority than if it's unambiguous, right? Think about like if the situation is a little bit, I think, like, let's say, wasn't it, I don't know if you cannot remember that, but I think a year or two years ago, there was this crazy thing going on where people couldn't figure out what is the color of a dress, is it blue or green or something like that, and everybody saw something different in situations like that. I think um, you're much more likely to uh, be under the influence of the majority, you feel a little bit unsure, and so you're willing to contemplate that you might be wrong and kind of change your mind accordingly. So group size and ambiguity help the um, majority to dominate the minority. One thing that's really interesting, another third factor is if we are race awareness of norms, okay? So is the person that violates the norms actually aware of the norms, okay? This is another act factor that um, increases the, uh, or kind of like norm compliant behavior, okay? So what do I mean by that? This is a famous study by uh, Robert Cialdini, who's kind of like he's, uh, will dominate the second part of uh, this week uh, with Milgram together. He's basically the most influential social psychologist within kind of like the marketing area and changing attitudes, persuasion, compliance, and so forth. All of the kind of fun experiments someone started with something that Cialdini did as an amazing book. I recommend it in the kind of on Moodle as well. It's called, I think it's not now called persuasion. I read it when it was called influence. Can only highly recommend it. One of the kind of he wrote it in the early 90s. 
and it still stands the test of time and it's basically the bible of all marketing research um and so uh, and it's a fun read really entertaining written so what did he do in like this experiment here uh, so Cialdini brought participants they observed participants whether they litter or not and they observed them in two different environments this is one environment here and obviously you can see this is like a very clear I mean this is not the actually this is like something okay don't say like oh if they're standing for litter boxes no this is like one environment where there was no litter on the floor nobody uh, it seems like that the social norm was we don't litter and then there was a neighborhood where the social norm is oh we do litter littering doesn't we don't care about litter right and so what they then did is um they would observe participants if they would litter or not um but they would have a confederate who either who would um kind of act out the dominant uh, norm. So in the uh, situation on the right, the person would litter in front of the participant and the person on the left, they would throw the garbage away and not litter. They would use a rubbish bin. Okay. So what they find here, good that I drew so much already on it to make it just really hard to read. But what you can see here, this is basically the percentage, the chance of littering. Okay. And what you can see here is like first, this is the pro littering norm. Here's littering is okay. This is the right kind of thing. And you see that people that like, in general litter much, much more. And here on the left, people do not litter that much. Okay. But now, if the Confederate littered, right? What you can see is now the Confederate littered. Now it becomes obvious. Oh, what is the norm here? Oh, we litter in this. Uh, now, like 50, every other um, participant littered too. As a German, this is unthinkable for me. I never litter. So it's like, this is like, I don't know. I can't, I can't, yeah, I can't get my head around this. Uh, but never throw anything on the, uh, on the floor, um, unless it's my own apartment, I have to admit. Okay. But it's a different story. But here you can see now in the, in a really tidy environment, right? In Yasmin's apartment, for instance, there it would be immediately obvious, right, that littering uh, uh, violates the norm. And now people, when they see somebody else litter, become less likely to litter because the same behavior kind of just makes obvious what the norm is. So making people aware of the norm is another way to do, that a majority can help to impact um, uh, behavior and norms exert a stronger influence than when the norm people are not aware or don't have the norm accessible at the moment, right? Um, you can think about uh, uh, similar, obviously, it depends a little bit on the country you're in. So who are the people? I think on the top, last year I was te co-teaching this with Stian. He was my co-pilot. He's from Norway. Uh, Norway or India are much more... Um, uh, um, collectivistic countries, so norms play a much more important role. People are much more norm compliant than countries like France, UK, or the US, who are much more individualistic. Okay, so dissent is somewhat. So there's a really interesting study. I didn't have time to include that, but basically in the US, if you are conforming to the group norm, then you're non-conformist, right? The stronger you identify with America, the stronger you think you should not be conform, uh, conform uh, or a uh, conformist, you should be individualistic. So it's basically, if you commit to the norm in these countries that are individualistic, then you are uh, uh, exerting, uh, uh, the, you're under the influence of social norms, but you say you're not, because that's the norm. Um, Okay, so this is like another one which like we talked about this last week It's just like how much do people know when we talk about why are women often more influenced in these early studies by these outside cues than men. This is like if they because the topics that were studied the women were less knowledgeable about these topics than the men, and if you're less knowledgeable about a certain topic you're more easily to be influenced if you change the topic and the women become much more knowledgeable, then they are less easily influenced so, for instance, if you want like if I go into a room full of I once was in a room full of uh, marketing um, specialist who says several things where I thought like this is just wrong and every agreed I would not change my mind because I knew uh, that I know the psychology better than they know um, so the more knowledgeable you are the less likely you're influenced the less knowledgeable the more easily you're influenced so there's a reason when some people say it's important if you want to uh, influence the masses to keep the masses stupid that makes them more perceptive to kind of misinformation and misleading. Um, 
So the last thing, and we want to kind of transition in the last five minutes on looking at like, okay, but how can we now, and obviously like, okay, all these factors that help the majority dominate the minority. How can it be that, um, like what are the conditions that basically enable the minority to um, uh, survive or, e or even flip the script, right? You can think about some norms where people are like, okay, uh, it seems like uh, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, unthinkable, today, perfectly fine, right? Um, and so one of the conditions that it says, like, if the majority here on the right, right, if the majority on the left, everybody agrees on the same thing, right, uh, it's one block, but if the majority has one person that somehow has another crazy opinion, right, then the majority kind of has less influence than if they don't have that crazy person, okay, so what do I mean by that? Think about this guy saying in these, and they did that in these experiments, saying everybody says C, okay, and now this guy says A, okay. So now I'm just like, okay, uh, everybody C, 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 this is A. And this somehow enabled him then to say, you know what, I stick with my B, okay. So what you see in this is like uh, that if somebody descends in a different way, in a wrongful way, right? You can kind of, I always call them in my mind, the, the flat earth people, right? If there's like one person says another crazy thing, right? Then this enables other dissent. And I think there's something to it, right? Um, where you can kind of see that often just tolerating dissent is really good in order for us to keep us open to new perspectives. There might be some crazy people out there, but it makes it also more likely that somebody who has the right solution comes up with it, okay? <laughs> so there is, in that sense, some kind of value in people who believe that the earth is flat, just so that they basically give permission to less crazy theories that might be right to be expressed. Um, so that's kind of like my takeaway here, but you can see it's also the more competent this person appears, okay, the more competent um, the descender appears, uh, the more likely it is that the, this guy sticks to their own guns, okay. Um, so this is another one, say, and that kind of transitions us to minority influence, okay? So you can think a little bit, oh, let me just say one more thing, um, and then, oh, okay, we'll just like do the minority influence. We might do like two minutes too long today, but I think it would be important to finish that. Why do people kind of um, do not want to dissent? And the, one of the key factors, right, is basically if you dissent, you get ostracized, right? Think about people like you less. They, when you ask about what do you think about the descendant, they think it seems like an honest and er, like a, a sincere person, um, but I don't like them. So you get ostracized, right? You kind of like, think, oh, you stick to your opinion, which is great. You're not conforming, which is also great, but we don't like you, right? So you get ostracized. And that's one that's a key driver for why basically the person does not want to stick to it. But you can see these instances where, oh, okay. So now there's like two people that are not liked because for instance, two years, uh, two decades ago, people thought like, okay, gay rights. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> it's hard to remember now, right? Thank goodness. What are the arguments against why people should not be gay? Right, somewhat unnatural, maybe it was not as against religious beliefs, etc. Right, that thing like two decades ago, that was not a, a outrageous thing to say. When I started studying uh, social psychology in New York, that was like the hottest topic. How can we um, uh, change the mind of the majority of Americans that being gay is not something bad? But then, now twenty years later. Right? There's basically very, very little dissent that anyone thinks like, okay, we should, nobody in the US, um, and I mean, there's always like the crazy ones, but the vast majority of people do not want to kind of make it illegal, give gays the same right as straight people and so forth, right? So this is like it completely changed within two decades. How is that possible? And that's one thing that uh, Moscovich become really interested. And he had to, he started with a very unique take on these ash paradigms. What he said is like, oh, what you can see here is actually it's the the influence of a crazy minority on a majority because this guy is actually the majority. He represents the rational people, uh, thinking people that are all with him that all clearly see. Okay, wow, this is B, okay? So he's, uh, Moskowitz's idea was like, this is actually an experiment about minority influence and not about majority influence. 
And he thinks like, wow, there's like under conditions where we can basically a crazy minority can somehow convince a majority at some cases uh, that they are right and the majority is wrong. I think it's a thought provoking take, but what made it more interesting is that he started to study it, right? In his experiments, it would be that you would come in and then there would be a confederate who would always, so we would be, let's say 10 students and or 10 participants and nine of us would see a blue square and we would say, what is it? It's blue. And one confederate would say it's green. Okay, and I would say, sometimes I would always say it, sometimes I would say less say it, sometimes I would say it more with confidence or not, okay. And now um, Moscovich wanted to know, okay, does that work? Does that influence anyone? And what you can see is basically that, okay, please, this is 9%, okay? This is, <laughs> I don't think like, oh my God, but it's like, if the guy or the, uh, or the person that always said, green, 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 green. If they never wavered their mind, once in a while, the majority became kind of convinced that, oh, maybe this time we saw a green thing, okay? Uh, so they saw blue, blue, they would always say blue, blue, and this guy was green, it's green, it's green, okay? The more confident that person is, the more the, the uh, it increases the minority influence. And this basically began the research on minority influence that says, if you wanna change the mind of the majority, you have to be confident, consistently pointing out that you are in, basically you have the kind of the right way to see um, the world and they have the wrong way, right? You have to say confidently uh, and uh, consistently that gays should have the same rights as straight people. Right, you should never waver, you should never compromise, you should never say, oh, there are two sides to this medal. No, you should stick to that. And that will at some point, and this is a kind of like, uh, let me uh, close at um, uh, uh, um, here at one o'clock. But this is basically the route how you can get to private conformity via minority influence. Because what you want to kind of poke is that at some point, the majority thinks, oh, maybe there's something we're missing. Maybe there's something that I've never thought about. Let me start to think about this. And thereby you get to informational influence, you get to a deeper processing, and thereby you might enable kind of like a, a private conformity and you can connect that, uh, connect that to the um, elaboration likelihood model that uh, we talked about last week. Okay. I would stop here. Um, I already got a little bit over time and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. It's always fun to talk about these experiments. They're really good. And I will stop the recording and uh, open the floor for questions.